Um, let's kind of let's go into the PowerPoint. I guess I don't need, to, I just need that screen back now. This is kind of a review of, of what we talked about in a, in a roundabout way, uh, looking at, a, at some commercial methodology and some backyard methods, and I think I probably have just about enough time to do it. So are we, what do I need to do to start? Just forward. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a real technologically advanced guy, so sometimes I confuse myself. <clears throat> so commercial orchard culture versus backyard orchard culture. Commercial hedgerow techniques, and we talked a little bit about hedgerows earlier, about using hedgerows to your advantage in the landscape. And actually, uh, the commercial fruit industry has been using hedgerow techniques for many years and are really, really moving towards that now. This technique is called a crossover, where, the, where they'll grow a tree out for the first season as a V, just a big double V, and then they pull it over itself. So they're creating a crossover. They can hold almost twice the amount of weight using a crossover system as they can by a single uh, open center tree. So here's a mature example. That one has actually uh, a triple. It's got three different, or two branches going this way and one coming back over this way. Uh, low scaffold. This is something that the commercial industry has been doing since day one. The commercial industry does not grow a high-headed tree. They want everything low. So those first cuts are done very low, 12 inches high when they plant commercial trees, maybe 18 inches high in some situations, but they don't want a big single trunk tree. They want a fruiting bush. They can much, much easier maintain a, a small compact plant than they can a big tree. Uh, horizontal oblique cordon apples, these are planted at um, uh, 36 inches apart and they're grown at a 45 degree angle on a wire well. So this is an old European technique that's being used quite a bit up in the, in the Lodi area right now on apples and pears. So very nice to create a hedgerow with something like that. For what reason? The, the 45s are angled into the wind, and the, and the trees are, are maintained on those. It's a double wire system, so they're maintained on the double wire system, taking advantage of all that growth that comes out up off the 45s. Uh, here's uh, apples five foot on center. So this is something that's being done all over now. One of the interesting <laughs> things is, the, these techniques are examples of how the commercial industry is now looking at backyard techniques in order to get more yield per acre. They're growing smaller trees on tighter spacings and getting more fruit per acre than they've ever produced before. The avocado growers that were taking the, those trees that were 25 feet on center, so they stub those trees down and whitewash them and interplant with one or two more trees. In three or four years, they're back up to twice the production that they had per acre before. So this technique our, th this backyard technique has absolutely caught on for the commercial growers. Tight spacings are a must. They're going with smaller equipment and more trees per acre. Tertiary system. This is just a simple uh, double T-bar trellis system. These are uh, our uh, uh, pairs on this system. And they're th that way you can grow these rows to north and south and you grow your fruiting branches out. Let's see. Back onto those... Uh, wire systems and, and with that north-south row, every branch on that tree gets equal amount of sun throughout the day. Perpendicular Vs, this again is a technique used for uh, strengthening and the ability to hold a large fruit set on the trees. These trees are grown very, very short in a V form and they're topped every year right there at about eight feet tall. Hedgerow apricots, apricots used to be um, 18 by 20 or 22. This row is uh, 12 feet wide, and these trees are eight feet apart. So they're, you know, again, more than twice as many trees per acre as what they would have planted before, almost double the yield. Uh, predominant central leader. This is kind of a technique that is going away. Nobody is. They used to use this a lot on apples and pears when they had bigger equipment. So this is actually peach. Um, using a perpendicular V and growing, or that uh, predominant central leader, and growing side branches out. So they're, they're still allowing for a pretty high central lead. These trees were probably uh, topped out at about 12 feet tall, but the old system using pears and apples was 25 feet tall. So they're bringing this, these systems down. One of the main reasons that they're, they're growing more trees per acre and smaller trees now is 
about uh, 20 years ago, the uh, liability insurance companies went in and said, you got people 60 foot up in that avocado tree picking avocados? Your insurance is done, canceled. We give you no, we're not gonna insure you against any issues that happen up 60 foot up in that tree. So the growers thought, huh, okay, you really only have one choice. We bring the tree size back down to where it's manageable and where most of the work can be done from the ground. And that's where the commercial industry has landed today. This is um, perpendicular V pear orchard, three foot on center. This is up um, outside of Sacramento in the winters area. And we're thinking that these are all new techniques. This acreage is now 90 years old. Yeah, so not new at all. We think summer pruning is new. This is a nice ad that I found in Fruit Grower Magazine from 1964. <laughs> so they were promoting summer pruning as far back as that. And if you drive down through the citrus orchards in Escondido or drive up through Ventura County and look at the way these commercial trees are maintained now, they're just a big, long hedgerow. And that's exactly the type of equipment they're, they're using to keep them that way. So where they used to grow lots of big trees, now they're growing smaller, more compact trees. Size management is every bit as important from a commercial grower's point of view as it should be to you. Time to prune. The old commercial pruning schedule was always prune in the winter. This is a Gravenstein apple orchard owned by my friend Norman Heckler in Woodstock Valley, Connecticut. Think Norm's going out to prune today? <laughs> I doubt it. Now, what, what he could have done and what what should have been done is about uh, September, all this long, whippy growth should have been taken off. This is a nice, tall spindle uh, Gravenstein apple. It's a nice side branching, plenty of fruiting wood, but all this long, whippy, vigorous growth has to come off. It, do it doesn't need to be there. That's not production wood. That's overgrowth from the summer. You're never going to see a flower or a fruit on that wood, so you've got to take it off. There's no reason to wait until winter time to do that. In fact, you want to do that while the tree still has ability to restructure its flowering wood and its fir wood. So doing this in mid to late summer makes a lot more sense than it does to do it in winter. So how much fruit can one tree produce? An 18-foot apple tree can yield 350 pounds of fruit. 700 half pound apple. So my question is, how many people ate 700 half pound apples last year? Anybody? Apple a day. App well, that's two apples a day. <laughs> so I can see 350. I can see uh, that, but I, I can't see 700. So even though that's one of my favorite varieties, that's Pink Lady, which is very low chili apple. So 700 half pound apples, six apples per pine. 116 apple pies. Now, that's an experiment that I've always wanted to try. I, I really don't think my, my, I have enough trouble with my waistline right now, so I don't think I would be able to do that. But it really sounds, an apple pie every three days? That sounds great. Yeah. So how many apple pies did you eat last year? So let's talk a little bit about true backyard orchard culture. We talked about rootstocks, how important they are. Here's a great example of what, um, if we were talking about, say, a Fuji apple or a Gravenstein apple or any standard apple variety. 30 foot on a standard rootstock is not uncommon. That's 30 foot. <laughs> so unpruned, your standard apple tree could easily get that size. So let's, uh, let's take it to semi-dwarf. There's 18 feet. So remember what we're looking for. I'm looking at putting up my hand and saying this is as I want my tree. So the average semi-dwarfing apple rootstock is going to give me this. And that's still three times as high or more than twice as high as I want that tree. So the dwarfing rootstocks for apples, we're still talking 10, 12 feet. So that's still higher than I want my tree, using the most dwarfing rootstocks there are for apples in general. So it, it, only common sense is going to tell us that in order to maintain a tree at a size that's manageable for us, we're going to make sure we need to incorporate pruning into that schedule. If we don't do that, the tree within about five years is going to overgrow itself and become a hindrance instead of an asset. At that point, the tree's too big, the, the fruit doesn't get thin, the birds get the high fruit, you're not up there picking. I'm not, I'm not going to climb 12 feet to pick an apple. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it. There's just no reason for that anymore. So regardless of whether your rootstock is dwarf, semi-dwarf, or standard, be willing to accept the responsibility to size control their trees so they're manageable for you. Okay. 
Wizard of Ozology. That's kind of where I'm coming from on most of this, because a lot of what I'm telling you today is undocumented information. You're not going to go to the UC Davis website or the UC Riverside website or Cal Poly Pomona and find information on how to grow a backyard tree. So what we're doing is hit and miss. And I'm, I'm, I definitely don't want you guys to think that I'm coming in here today and I'm telling you what you have to do. All I'm doing is making recommendations on how you don't need to make the same mistakes that I've made over the last 40 years. I'm telling you what's been successful for me and these methods can work for you. What you choose to do is entirely up to you and I leave it wide open. I'm not gonna tell anybody what you can and can't do in your landscape in any way, shape, or form. All I'm gonna tell, tell you is what I think is easier methodology to accomplish it properly. So don't get me wrong. I'm not, I don't wanna pigeonhole anybody. And you don't go and say, well, Tom Spellman said that I have to keep trees this high and I can't grow any higher than that. No, it's not what I'm saying. You grow a tree so that it's manageable for you. Whatever size you choose, whatever method you choose, whether you want organics or chemicals or, or no fertilizer at all, whatever you want to do is okay with me because it, it just has to work for you. So high density pruning. Here's a 10 year old Santa Rosa plum. This is actually a tree that you'll see more of in this presentation. Uh, we did uh, a history on this tree from, from the time it was planted. but Basically we like to keep that tree like this. So again, everything size managed. You can reach all of, the, all of the fruit, all of the thinning, all of the harvesting, everything can be done from a reasonable size. This tree still produces 150 to 300 fruit per year, and it's no more than six feet tall. You see the nice uh, multiple branching down at the base. It's got a really nice, well-formed canopy. Well, let's go back and look at that. All that long, whippy growth on top doesn't make any difference because I'm never going to let that stay there in fruit. So here it is, midsummer, late summer, it's time to take it off. Uh, prune after fruit set to help thin, absolutely a great way to thin. I don't like to stand there and pick, 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 pick all the time. So you can make some nice thinning cuts just by doing a little pruning. I probably took 20 apricots off just with that one cut. But let me roll through quickly um, since I am officially out of time. Uh, planting, we talked about raised bed. I talked about how important it was to have that oxygenating layer. However you choose to create a raised bed, you can do it. Uh, make that first cut low. So the, here's a year, you know, year old or two year old bare root tree. You want to make that first cut at a low size so that you develop a nice low fruiting canopy. Here's that same Santa Rosa plum in year one. This was actually a challenge to, that was given to my friend Ed Libo, uh, where a Northern California nurseryman said, "You can't keep a Santa Rosa plum small." And Ed said, "Yes, I can, and I'll, I'll do it, and I'll document it for you." So here's. Uh, Here's a few years in the life of that Santa Rosa and a little bit of Ed's evolution too. Year three, year four, year five, year six, year seven, year eight, ten years. So, and the tree is now 18 years old and it's still maintained at that size. There it is at 12 years. Harbir Singh, one of our production managers. All the new people that come to work for Dave Wilson, we let them prune this tree for one year so that we, we get them experienced into, into how you should keep that tree small. I like what Harbert did. He pruned it like a loaf of bread. <laughs> so canopy should start at knee high. Low cuts give you that nice low canopy. Here's a Craig's Crimson Cherry pruned within, within size height so you can reach every branch and every fruit on that tree. When you're keeping it really, really low, though, it didn't feel as if there was a lot of um, it felt very heavy on the inside. Is there a problem? Open up the sun. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, here's some trees planted at one of our customers up uh, east of Sacramento. 700 foot parking lot. Planted trees 10 feet on center along the fence. This is kind of um, a casual espalier style. He didn't put them on the structure. All he did was keep them pruned off at about five and a half feet and just let them grow out along the fence and, and, and kept them out of the aisleways and out of the parking lot. So you can manage trees in any form that works for you. Here's heavenly white nectarine pruned to six feet. Some people say they're not getting enough fruit off of a small tree. 250 softball sized nectarines on a tree that year. So uh, four trees in one hole, early, early mid, late mid and late season all together. So you get two months or two and a half months worth of ripening instead of two or three weeks. 
four trees 18 inches on center. You can go 18, 24, 36, 48, whatever works for you. Just keep, keep like varieties together on like rootstocks. Here's a four in one cherry, two years old. Here it is uh, at six years old, the same combination. So right, still maintaining walking. size. Pardon? Are, are the branches when you're walking or are they all going? Either whatever way you like. Oh, Doesn't matter. Remember, I'm telling you, I'm just, I'm just giving you concept. What you choose to do with it is entirely up to you. <laughs> See, 11 years old, still only as tall as you can reach. Uh, combined uh, varieties uh, that are compatible. Here's peach, nectarine, and apricot. So uh, high density plus size control equals BYOC, everything we talked about today. Three in one, uh, peach, nectarine, apricot. A lot of these are pretty rough. The shots look rough, and then they are, because we don't spend a whole lot of time on any of these trees. You know, we're not, I'm, my concept is not to keep these trees manicured. My trees is to keep these trees size controlled so that they fit into a small area. How you choose to maintain them, what so, you choose to do with them is entirely up to you. So it's still 18 inches, though, apart. Those are 24. 24. Here's six trees in 10 feet, two three and ones. And the nice thing about this, there's no rules. I'm not going to tell you how far apart you should plant your trees or what combination you should put your trees in. It's whatever works for you. We talked about multi-buds earlier. Here's a four-in-one apple. You can see that um, this branch is fairly vigorous. And then here's the wheat variety, the wheat graft. So what we need to do in order to bring this to a balance is cut everything down to match the weakest variety on the tree. Never let vigor dominate the combination. Always keep the vigorous varieties reduced so that they're no more vigorous than the weakest variety on the tree or the combination. There it is after a couple seasons. There it is dormant with the weak bud established. See, here's that weak bud right here. Here's the major cuts that were made before. So now we have a nice balanced canopy after just two seasons. Cut back and thin in the spring. You, like I said, you can do this anytime. Whatever works for you. You don't need to follow an agriculturalist's or a farmer's schedule to be successful in your backyard. Three and one fruit salad. I'm going to run through pretty quick so I can get these out of the way. So those are multi budded, high density hedgerows. Here's 12 trees and 40 feet. Here's two foot on center plums. Here's 18 inches on center fruit throughout the season, so the, all those varieties, successive ripening. Control tree size, we talked about that. Here's that row of trees, 18 inches on center. And um, what, we, what we did is we didn't maintain this row for two years. We, let the, we just let it go crazy. So the, the production guys came in and said, look, we're, we can take the bulldozer and push that all out of there and plant something new. And we said, no, we're going to bring the chainsaw in and we're going to cut these back to just a basic structure and see what we get. So not maintained for two years, grown as a big thicket. Here's recovery the first season. So we did lose one tree. It was one in that row that didn't grow back out. It already had a heart rot problem. It had termites in it. And it was going to go regardless. It would have gone within a year or so. But look what at, at the nice, well-maintained, respectable row that we get back out of that. So you, know, you can come in and correct problems. Just because a tree became too big or too large or too unruly doesn't mean you can't come in and do corrective pruning. So more fruit in less space, accommodate pollinating varieties, successive ripening for fruit all season long, easy maintenance, and, and endless aesthetic possibilities. Remember I told you be creative. So here's an example of, of uh, trees grown in a hard pan situation. The soil is real heavy. All we did was dump a bucket full of mulch on the ground and plant the trees in the mulch mound. No soil at all. No hole. Nothing. Just plant it in a, in a mulch mound. There they are after one season. Raised beds, raised beds are strictly for oxygenation, for getting that root zone up out of the heavy soil. So you can create a raised bed any way you want. You want to use 2 by 12s or just build a mound, or you want to use uh, uh, rocks and, and boulders and driftwood and all kinds of things. You can do whatever you want. So here's uh, Mike Tomlinson. He's actually our graphic artist and, and does a lot of work on our website. He's done all kinds of creative things like that just using things that he found around the nursery. So rocks, big piece of driftwood, old walnut stumps, just whatever he found to create some nice raised beds. He's real proud of those. He has probably a dozen of them on the property that he maintains. So we talked about the benefits of mulching. Uh, 
I can't emphasize that enough. In fact, I will say again, if you're not willing to mulch, your landscape should be colored rock and pink flamingos. <laughs> Covering techniques, this is for, for freezing and freezing rain. We'll go through those real quick. Bird netting, very important if you have a bird issue. And I guarantee you, you're not going to throw a bird net over a 20-foot tree, but one person can throw it over an 8-foot tree in a matter of seconds. A spellier, speliers used as much for function as art, but you know, any a spellier tree looks cool. This is a about a 10-year-old apricot tree up against a chain link fence, just grown out along the fence, eight feet high, 12 feet wide, no more than 12 inches out from the fence. So the nice thing about that, every branch, every flower, every piece of fruit on the tree gets equal amount of, uh, of air movement and light exposure. Good quality fruit comes from espalier trees. Here's an espalier fig. Here's some work that was done by the uh, UC Master Gardener Group up in um, just east of Sacramento. And they have done some beautiful work with espaliers. They've done these nice candelabras. They've done these bird cages uh, using pears and apples and all kinds of great plants in, the, in that project. Fair Oaks Master Gardens. If you're ever up there, I recommend you go and check out this project. Deer fencing. We'll talk about that. Uh, same thing, review. There's a scraggly mess. There's mismanaged trees. So, you know, using trees, using fruit trees as ornamentals, you get great flower color, you get great fall colors, you can make great structures and use them for different functions. All kinds of different reasons that you can incorporate fruit trees in a landscape style, not in an agricultural style. Double the spellier. Here's a, a, actually a braided fig, three fig trees grown together, a white, a brown, and a black. There it is after that season's recovery. I know you know what it is, I just told you what it is. Blueberries, I do for containers, you've got the handout. My favorite slide, I'll just talk about this one. This is a, uh, this is a walnut uh, grower up in the... Um, San Joaquin Valley, that um, uh, the, the old grandfather planted the original walnut grove in 1903. And he planted these uh, five black walnuts in a row in an area between an irrigation ditch and a, and a canal and a, and a road. And just, just said, I'm just going to use these as my seed trees for black walnut to graft my English varieties onto. And I'm not going to give them any of my valuable orchard space. So these trees were, were planted in 1903, maintained in an area no more than 10 feet wide, Everything that grew out along that area he maintained, everything that grew within the bounds of the, of the road or the canal was removed. So here they are now, you know, over 110 years old. When I did some consulting years ago for Disney when they were developing the California Adventure theme park, they wanted to incorporate a lot of agriculture and fruit trees into that program, and I showed them this slide. And after I showed them the slide, at the end of the presentation, they, the big guy came up to me and he said, um, we would like to buy those walnut trees. <laughs> and we'll take full responsibility. We'll, move, we'll dig them, we'll move them, and, and take all responsibility. And he took out his business card and he wrote down a number and he handed me the card and he goes, you offer them this. And I looked at the card and I said, well, it's worth a phone call. So I called him up and said, hey, Disney wants your grandfather's walnut trees and here's what they're willing to pay. And, you know, they, they, they family's got 3,000 acres of, San Joaquin Valley farmland and make a great living off of almonds and walnuts and they didn't need the money so they didn't sell the trees to Disney. But I have to tell you that if that if they were my trees, you could see them today at Disney's California. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>